everybody. Uh, this is Dan Lapel for New Focus Recordings. Uh, really excited to be joined by Martin Scherzinger, composer, musicologist, uh, and the uh, primary artist behind his upcoming release, Scherzinger Etudes, which is the second uh, album he's put out on New Focus, the first being African Math. Um, how's it going, Martin? Great to see you. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Dan. It's so good to see you as always. And thank you so much for putting in the energy to make this amazing project happen. So uh, with African Math, FCR 153, the, the context was you're from South Africa and a lot of your work uh, has rotated around uh, musical, musicology that examines various traditions in Africa, but also how uh, Western composers have integrated that those traditions into their work. Is that a sort of fair characterization of, I, I don't mean to encapsulate who you are in like a little sound bite, but. Uh... Yeah, so the music work that I did, I mean, I came to this country basically with the idea that um, there was, uh, you know, on African instrumentaria, there was a kind of archive of mathematical thinking. So they were kind of within these, um, the instrumental digital interfaces themselves. And I call them digital because they often are more digital uh, uh, instruments than even in the West. So often, you know, this sort of, um, it, it, you know, either a kind of, uh, some kind of mallet on something or um, a thumb on, 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 on an iron rod and so on. So um, I call them digital um, instruments. Um, and uh, I came to this country basically very interested in, in that, um, trying, to, trying to sort of shed light on some of the mathematical, symbolic, formal thinking that was at work in this music that was hopelessly under-narrated. African music was often seen as, you know, full of dance and embodiment and kind of mystical knowledge and this kind of thing. I thought, well, no, it's actually highly rationally organized. It's, you know, the harmonies on the Imbira Zawadzimu, for example, um, if, you, uh, if you, you were to sort of flip them back to front, if you were to do a retrograde inversion on them, for example, something that, you know, Schoenberg or someone might have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, well adept at doing, you'd get exactly the same music. And this was kind of fascinating to me, that it was a kind of retrograde invertible music, something that in the West was seen as kind of, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit too academic and, you know, Augenmusik, they would say about Schoenberg. And I'm like, well, hold on a minute. We've got this other tradition that's really interested in these kind of recursive fractal patterns. And I got really into that and I found also it was hopelessly under-narrated, even to this day, you know, this overvaluation of African uh, rhythm, um, timbre, you know, we, we, we dare not call um, something harmony because we worry that it might be a timbre or something. And so we miss some of this kind of basic, interesting um, uh, uh, sort of symbolic systems that are at work in this pre-colonial music. And then we often attribute this um, uh, and, and, then, and, then, and then generate cliches around what we do here, which is like a timbrely rich, rhythmically complex and so on. And that becomes a kind of epistemology of cliches. And I was really, really not into that because um, I, you know, in this country where I came from, I grew up under, you know, apartheid, which was a kind of separate but equal um, ethos, which was you know, devastating. It was kind of like hyper identity politics. So I just can't do it. I can't um, see one culture as being like inherently different. Different. I think it's a, of course, there are inflections and wonderful contributions and different groupings of people make in different contexts, but I couldn't, I couldn't see it in this granular, uh, uh, sorry, in this vulgar way of like, you know, Africans are, are, are good at embodiment and Westerners are, are, are good at, at thinking or something. So that's how I, uh, that's how I, I came with that baggage. Uh, to this country, and then that, and then I got involved with music, um, and uh, did 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 you know did, did a degree here, and then and then and then left it eventually, and moved into media studies, where I recalled some of my my legal um, studies from uh, earlier on, because I, I first uh, studied law, and uh, and now I'm out of music, and it's in that context actually, it's once I got out of music that I started to write these etudes, um, which have now kind of uh, bubbled around for about five years. Um, and I think there I was just really recalling a, a certain kind of almost like childlike joy that I take in music because I'd been released of it professionally. Um, and interestingly, what I found a, 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 you know, an aspect of freedom in that. Um, I think people often think about uh, creative freedom um, as something that, you know, that one really has to fight for. So, um, you know, I would listen to this music uh, that was part of the household um, in combination with uh, African music, which was part of the landscape. Um, and, uh, you know, and I then loved it so much and thought, you know, I'm listening to all this music again, 
you can't write music like this because it feels dated and so on and so forth. But, but why not? And this was the moment of, of releasing. And I wanted to hear the music again, but as if for the first time. And that's a very strange thing to do because the first time you hear something, especially when we are in this kind of childlike mode or in this mode of, um, I don't know, sort of it's something unmediated about one's um, sort of encounter with music um, that happens in a childlike way also as adults. Um, you know, it's the Mondegreen thing, right? You know, excuse me while I kiss the sky or while I kiss this guy. Who cares? Who cares? It's actually the Mondegreen is, you know, in my case, a little more interesting. But, you know, um, but but it's like, it's almost like the words don't belong there. They don't matter. They, we can't um, even, um, you know, the, what they're saying doesn't matter so much. They say something, but the affective kind of sonorous envelope in which they are wrapped is so interesting. And so we just kind of go with it. And this going with the flow of the pattern on a surface sort of level struck me as a kind of childlike in the liberating sense of the word um, way of listening that I wanted to approach these pieces um, and so I would you know do simple things like take take some of my favorites and just flip them backwards or um, turn them upside down and then in, investigate passages and listen to them again and say wow whose music is this this wasn't conceptualized by some human right but because of the amazing I don't know cosmological mathematical kind of crystallization that goes into the, the making of music, whether it's the design of the piano itself, which almost writes itself. It's like a grammar of action that, that one can barely go wrong because it's so well designed. Um, same thing for any, any instruments that in some ways reached its telos, you know. And I, I found it was amazing how many sort of magical um, sort of angels were unleashed by simple maneuvers like flipping things back to front and so on. An idea that in some ways I got uh, from those African origins because in Africa, it's not just that the harmonies had these wonderful palindromic effects and were fractal-like incarnating large scale kind of harmonic motion within smaller scale harmonic motion, and that you could run it back to front and flip it around and so on. It wasn't just that, but it was um, also every sort of um, inherent pattern in something like Amadinda music is in fact a beautiful polyrhythm and all of these polyrhythms are what we call non-retrogradable or palindrome structures so you can run them back to front and you get the same music and i just think this is a remarkable thing and again there's plenty of racism around this right i mean even physicists released a paper um like in 2020 uh, describing the difference between noise and music and they said you know it's the non-reversibility factor like noise is reversible and music isn't it's, it's remarkable because really it's just a way of saying well, you know, African music would, I guess, just be noise under that rubric. But it's such carefully designed palindrome that it's obviously not noise. And we hear this wonderful kind of uh, ratio-like kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 phenomenology in, in African music. We know that it's all kind of making sense, but the timing is always just that little bit surprising. And it's, you know, and this kind of thing um, really I found fascinating. So I thought, well, you know, let me just like, approach these favorites and see what happens if I if I just use these slightly Africanized techniques. Um, but more, I think, in the end, to, to, to capture the charm of a certain kind of listening that I identify with childhood, which is why I, I, I began with that Walter Benjamin image of the child pulling the horse or pushing the horse, not knowing the difference between back and front. It doesn't matter. It's, um, it, it's a phenomenon. It's a relationship. And that relationship, you know, um, is, is what matters more than whether they get it right, you know. And theories of time across the globe are, you know, fascinating. I, I work on that a little bit now. Um, and, you know, the idea of a unilinear kind of um, temporality is, is very recent in, um, uh, in the history of time. Um, it's associated with Newton, uh, uh, at, you know, and, and the Newtonian sort of concept of moving from, you know, infinity to past, to infinity into the future, and then subdividing it into equidistant kind of units like a ticker tape. That's all very recent and, you know, super Euro industrial. Um, in Madagascar, you move backwards into the future. All you see is the past and you, we are blind into the future, which is of course much more realistic but um, but difficult for Westerners to sort of imagine as being the case, you know. Um, and so that's how I, um, I, I approached it. I think a lot of these things um, are sort of somehow sublimated into the work. I mean, I don't really know, but I, but um, yeah, it, it's something like that. Perhaps um, one way of thinking about it is if, if I were to say focus on the first etude, which is called um, The Horse Is Not Mine, A Hobby Horse. Um, and it comes from uh, Schumann's uh, Ritter um, uh, from Stock and Fat thing, which is, you know, the rider of the hobby horse or the, the play, play horse. Um, and I think there, 
what I did was I took that piece and of course ran everything backwards, but then it was like, well, that's interesting, but not quite enough. And, um, and so I pretended that the music was in some sense imagining that I was Schumann, but I would be forced to write the uh, Stock and Fair piece on an Imbina Zawadzimo. What happens now? So you're just forced to, you know, and it's, a, it's, it's an interesting project because you take an instrumental interface, which is difficult to play sort of Mozart on. It's not that easy to play Mozart on an Imbina Zawadzimo, which is why they don't hybridize so easy. And the hybridizations that do happen are often weak. Um, but, and then, you know, but you've got this harmonic world that's generated by, you know, the newly arrived tempered piano forte, which is this magical sort of horse-like instrument, you know, from the 19th century. And you say, okay, well, what would happen now if you would have to write that piece there? Or if for some reason he had somehow found himself at the great Zimbabwe, right? Um, near Masvingo in, in Zimbabwe. And this is before, in some sense, the era of, um, of, 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 you know, hybridization everywhere and colonization everywhere. Um, and that sort of encounter unleashed something interesting because I just made sure that no notes ever touch. I, I gave it the radical kind of interlock. And suddenly the music sounds like you're so singable, but it's in fact got these fragmented little motivic bits that are flying off the edges um, in a way that's really mysterious and interesting to me. And it's a little lucky, you know, I've, I found the music. This is, this is found music. Um, yeah, even though it doesn't exist, it's found in a way. And I think the, the freedom of, 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 of putting, you know, of, of releasing this horrible, um, I, sorry to say the word, but sort of, capitalist notion of creative expression and all that, which is what secures our copyright and therefore we have this stupid concept, but it's, it's saying there is no creative expression. I'm not here. I am not me. I am not here, uh, uh, which is actually the beginning of the horse is not me. The, the horse is not mine. It's a Russian expression. I am not me. The horse is not mine, which is a way of, per, you know, um, sort of asserting your innocence, but, but, but like not being oneself and just saying, you know, let me pretend I'm some other person and let me pretend I'm on this other instrument and what would happen that's the rules of the game see what happens and see if there are any angels sort of hidden in there and as it happens you know I am sort of stunned by how many there were and um, you know again it wasn't my project alone Bobby Mitchell the pianist was a genius he's a total poet and he's a complete Schumann virtuoso I mean he's doing things with Schumann now that I think are really unlocking some of those wilder temporalities I think Schumann was you know very interesting he was kind of a proto-African in the sense that the bar line was something restrictive to him so he's always like pulling something just before the bar line and then the points of emphasis are always dislocated beautifully and there's Demiolas coming out everywhere you know amazing stuff and so in a way he sort of was suited to this um uh, kind of world uh, as well, but 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 Bobby the pianist was kind of completing that project. I often call him Florestan because he's just so good at you know channeling these things. Um, uh, and and it was about halfway through the project that he actually said to me, "I'm also Eusebius, so we started to write some slow music also." Yeah. But yeah, so I think that's something like the world that the that these etudes are in. I mean, I don't know if it's interesting to anyone else, but I found it just very fascinating. Well, it's, it's definitely interesting to hear you talk about this stuff and to sort of, in my mind, uh, I can't help but understand it as an extension to a certain extent of your work on African math, where you sort of mapped uh, Africanized, or, or I guess we're going to say Africanized, in, African uh, sort of um, uh, structures, musical structures onto a piano trio, right? Uh, and found a way to sort of orchestrate that music within the context of a, a very common Western instrumentation. But here it's almost like you're taking some of those ideas one step further, taking the material from the Western tradition and in a way flattening things in such a way that you can sort of see more commonalities between different traditions and illuminate uh, that a lot of these types of uh, manipulations of, of pitch and rhythm are actually sort of have a, a, a cross uh, stylistic uh, affinity there. Is that is that sort of an okay way to characterize things or? Yeah, I, th I think that's in the ballpark, right? I mean, one can get quite specific. You said flattening and the harmony, you know, harmony goes awry when you run it in reverse, but 
uh, it has this amazing sort of weird syntax going on. And actually Brahms also like creates very often, you know, uh, he, he had done a lot of like harmony flipping. So, it, you know, this is interesting and there's even a theory um, around um, sort of inversional kind of uh, work that, that that takes hold in you know, a German imagination by the end of the 19th century. Um, you know, uh, Hugo Riemann and others who start to think of undertones and overtones as, as being somehow symmetric and so on. So there's a lot of that thought going on in, in Europe too and one could create that uh, resonance. But I think here what's interesting is that, you know, the European thing is said to be much more narrative and linear, like the Newtonian thing, right? So it's as if it were grounded in some kind of like telos and was becoming and so on, uh, you know, and, 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 and we think about Beethoven as uh, the, the heroism of the fifth, you know, it starts with this jagged, very masculine, but like unhinged motive. And by the end, it becomes this kind of militarized march, right? And this thing of linear and linearity and narrative is, 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 is sort of ingrained in, in the way we are thought to understand uh, uh, Western music. And, and I think that that's kind of also slightly confused because I don't think that that is the only thing that's going on there. It's clearly sort of cycles and developments. It's, uh, it's circles and lines. Um, and, you know, especially in the context of theme and variation form, but also all sorts of other ones, um, you find that the linearity is maybe a little over narrated. It's not like language, which really goes bizarre if you start reading it uh, backwards, you know, um, but, but it, 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 is, it, doesn't, it doesn't have that language like that character, but for some reason that came to be, I think, the sort of um, dominant um, metaphor that, that, that guided it. And then other cultures or other, you know, musics were seen to be cyclic and all of this. And I, again, I don't I resist that a little bit, you know, because it turns out that, you know, um, it turns out that there are absolutely developmental narratives built into so-called cyclic music and, and the other way around, that there's cyclicity always at work um, in, in, in the so-called developmentalist uh, music. And then, you know, the, and the relationship that has with industrial development. And there's a bit of an ideological kind of like um, thing going on behind there, all of which I resist exist completely um and so i don't know so so this flattening um this yeah, presentation maybe the, the, i think flattening was the wrong word but like more or less trying to uh create a context where you could illuminate some sort of common uh factors that you, you know uh as as opposed to, in a way getting getting rid of some of the, the baggage that you're talking about where there are these sort of uh, assumed uh, associations with different stylist, stylistic uh, genres. I don't know. Yeah, flattening was probably a, a poor word choice, but but well, actually, I, nevertheless, I, it, it canalized I an interesting. Myself. Yeah, it canalized yeah, yeah. an interesting clarification. So, uh, so yeah. That's good. I mean, what makes the African math thing a little bit different was I was a bit more sort of burdened directly by the cliches that, you know, it's epistemology of cliches, as I call it. So in there, really the going bland uh, on the in modern industrial piano and like putting this as sheer syntax, right, which is like divorced from all of the embodiments, all of the gestures, all of the rich timbral inflections of these these amazing instruments like the timbila or like the uh, akadinda the empire Mira, matepe all of these which is what that music really was and putting it onto this this kind of corporate industrial instrumentarium which was the heart of the european thing it was through that that different values in the music could actually weirdly shine through so it was like here's this like african music what happens if we sort of reduce out all of those things we find so alluring and, you know because on first hearing, um, it seems that that's what's important about it. Um, that's, you know, then suddenly something interesting happens, right? Because the transformations are interesting in its, its, and for moments it did even throw us back into, it sounded a little bit like Bida Maya or, um, you know, some kind of Renaissance dance, or, you know, there was, there was a way in which it, it really was quite close to um, this, this European music purely because of the timbre switch, but also a nice inflection on it, you know, but I, I think the important thing there was to bring out different values because, to me, when somebody sort of notices the timbrely rich um, character of saving Biro Zawadzimu, something is at stake there that is also that has also got to do with, you know, here's something I've never heard before. And the first thing that strikes you is the timbre, right? And so therefore it's kind of a shallow listening, even though it seems deep because it's like spectrograms and whatever, but it's actually quite shallow because it then effaces or the ear kind of 
uh, what remains out of earshot is the blandly sort of syntactic grammar of the music. And I just thought bringing a little bit of that back into the into earshot was worthwhile. It was more of a conscious kind of project, whereas this one I feel um, I'm I, I cannot shed the African thing, even when I try and I and I moved, you know, towards purely like European fare that I've also sort of fallen in love with. And I, I think that that's that's what's what's interesting here. And then this, um, you know, you can see it in the way um, in the way, uh, you know, one uh, one hears the music almost like an African child, because it's like you hear it as a kind of, and you said it, but I said, I called it kind of flattened contrapuntal syntax or, you know, the neutralized harmonies and so on. I think that that's, that that's important because um, the functionality is, is now dysfunctional in the traditional sense, but yet it carries so much logic with it because it's doing something quite specific. And so that logic that's working there is to me um, a deeply illuminating of like this world that's like, Right there, but then we often we often just sort of leave it um, we leave it unnoticed or unchecked. Um, so um, yeah, there is so much of it was was like that. And I think that's why the titles also have you know that, that you, a, a friend of mine was well. Hold on, are we going to you know who was helping me edit the titles and said, well, do you want to you know. Um, do you want to give it all the English inflection? Do we need to italicize stuff? I said, definitely no italicization. And then also, do we need to use the caps and lowercase in the English convention? Um, and I thought, no, because English isn't even the uh, primary uh, language necessarily here, right? It's one of many. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, two or three titles are in English and the others are in something else, uh, either Swahili or Shona or uh, French or, or Italian, depending on where the origin of that music is, you know, to the extent that it can be um, identified. And so, so I wanted it to be free of all of that kind of, um, uh, all of that kind of, um, uh, how should we say, uh, cultural balkanization, um, which is not to say easy hybrids or whatever. It's, uh, it's an attempt still to reckon with um, what are the, what is that? Because there's no hybridity without loss, to quote my wonderful mentor, Kofi Agawu, um, that, you know, especially in Africa, right? I mean, he, he wrote a wonderful essay called Tonality as a Colonizing Force, in which, um, you know, he shows how, um, you know, how, how tonality is introduced into this environment, but in an abbreviated way, you know, solfege instead of like notation and so on. And it yet becomes a dominant musical language in, in many parts. I mean, Uganda is a great case in point because they have the most amazing, like probably the most virtuosic music that ever existed, which is this Akadinda music where people play at high speed, 600 beats per minute uh, in interlocking spaces. You know, it's a unbelievable music and more or less archaic now. And yet their national anthem is the most trite sort of three and a half chords, right? That Ola, it's the shortest anthem in the world. It sounds like, you know, a devastating kind of provincial English town. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we have. And so tonality is a colonizing force. So there is no, and, and the Lubiri court, which is where this music was performed, um, has been destroyed, right? It has been, well, it was destroyed by Moulton Abote in 1968 post-liberation because they were seen as collaborators of the colonials. So it's a very complicated history there um, that due to colonialism and its after effects left entire kind of traditions and almost like museum fulls of like remarkable cultural achievements in ruins, right? So the place was burnt down, raised to the ground um, and the Kabaka had to flee. Um, and the musicians, you know, great musicians like uh, Mutesa, um, Tamasua Motesa, greatest harpist in the world, you know, killed and so on, right? So, uh, so th this is the this is the reality for Africa, and so there's no hybridity without loss. So I'm aware of that. I'm not like gung ho, like oh my god, isn't this fun? We just put this in pastiche. No, it's more like what happens when we do certain thought experiments, and what does it show about each of these cultures, right? What does it bring to light? So something like that does feel important to me. So I wouldn't call it a political uh, political uh, uh, move, but. Uh, something about the emancipatory kind of character of the aesthetic is in there, right? So it allows something to like shine forth. I'm exaggerating the case. This music is probably much more humble than that. But you know, these are the ideas that that that, that generate um, one's activity with the notes. You know? Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, I, something you said earlier really sort of resonated with me too. Uh, I can't remember if this was before we actually started recording or not, but the 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 sense that this was you stepping back from engagement 
uh, with music in a certain kind of uh, hyper professional way and trying to reconnect to sounds that you heard uh, sort of as a newer listener when you were younger. And, but of course it's gonna be informed by all this work that you've done and, and it's all sort of, uh, but there's a, there's a cool sense of that, um, as you sort of said, like childlike listening that, that is going on in taking these familiar uh, sort of sources from the piano repertoire, filtering them through this other understanding of how music works and uh let's you know we've we've talked and it's been great but let's listen let's let the music speak for itself for a second uh should we play some some of the first uh tracks since we sort of referenced that a couple times i think that's a great idea okay so this is uh the horse is not mine a hobby horse Great. Uh, that that gives us that's a great sort of first track for the album. It, it, it sets the tone. It gives us some some context. Uh, tell me a little bit about the the second track, Verso Il Capo, which is is sort of bringing in material from from Brahms piano repertoire. And then also you there's a sort of quasi reprise of that uh, piece as the the final right Verso Il Capo to which is which is quite extended actually it's it's almost twice as long yeah so that one started the verso um your couple refers to um refers to a reversal of a simple theme by um by handel so it takes us right back to the beginning of the era of the piano in a way because um handel writes this round about the time that Cristofori sort of standardizes the modern uh, pianoforte which is of course a very interesting instrument um, and 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 for a while, I was thinking about um, doing something different because I was thinking about like uh, in media studies, which is where I study about the character of like designs interfaces for the human body, from typewriters to piano keyboards to mirrors of to you know the way in which the body was comported by the instrument and. Um, and so uh, that one there was, I thought, well, you know, let's start with that handle theme at the origin of the piano and push it all the way through Brahms's variations on it, all the way into, in some sense, the future, because um, because the, the it, because the piano is, in some sense, the platonic age, uh, a, a platonic instrument of our time, right? It sublimates 
um, certain assumptions about how music goes. And even MIDI and so on began very much uh, based on a clavio-centric kind of model, right? And so we had even the dominant representation scheme for music in the digital world or in software was basically the piano. So I had this idea um, to do something called the typewriter opera. But the opera wasn't about singing voices, it was about the piano as a typewriter opera. The piano is a kind of uh, it, music inscription device in where you type for sound. And this is shared also with many African instruments, right? That you're typing up something and then it produces um, some kind of usually illusory trick, right? So it was, it's, it's actually an illusion. I mean, uh, it's a hammer blows and yet it's, so it's a music of full stops or periods, as you say in America, like music of, of, of full stops, digital, but we put things together, the ear puts things together as if they were melodies, as if it were singing, as if it were operatic. And I just found that whole thing fascinating. I think, the fascination began again with some of the African instruments, like if you take a matepe and the radical interlocking, the ventriloquistic effect of that when two uh, uh, musicians interlock like this, where you never play in the spaces of the other, producing a third entity, which is the real music. So what's coming to the ear is different to what's being typed by the hand. I think that that, so you're sort of typing a logical sentence down here, but so is your partner in music. And in the third, thing has a logic entirely unto its uh, on its own it's like a different sentence is being typed by you but you got to keep going and that motor pattern is asynchronous with the illusory pattern that is the third thing this is the total magic of african music completely under narrated not fully understood it's seen again as embodiment etc it's not embodiment it's actually seeking out the voices of the ancestors that speak like ventriloquists through the music it's super fascinating and then i thought wow you know Africans are so adept at generating these kind of haunting kind of ghost patterns out of um, out of simpler structures by just by 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 just sort of dividing the um, how should we say the uh, uh, you know the 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 um, the work done right carefully like the division of labor is carefully construed and then the the interface of the actual instrument is so well crafted that it generates this possibility of total magic right uh, of a third thing that belongs to nobody is the voice of the ancestor as if visited upon by far or someone from afar but it isn't ventriloquism or acousmatics in the west where you have you know the idea that oh the acousma right where you in you know, the, the cave of delphi or something and it speaks back and you and you you know it's it's actually a different kind because the acousmatic voice is hidden. We don't know the source, like, you know, horror movies, like you hear some sound and you think, oh, something is up, but I can't see it. And you get shivers down the spine. That's acousma in the West. In Africa, it's like, these were very visible. You can see the mode of production very visibly, but the thing is still different to what you see. So the eye and the ear are tricking each other out of each other, psyching each other out. And then the music, you know, the third thing is this amazing thing. And of course it, it, it gets cosmological significance, etc. And then I was thinking, you know, the piano actually is a lot more ventriloquistic than I realized because it's also tricking the ear in this funny way. And the, the usual relationship by which we identify, um, you know, uh, seen things with heard things is actually also ruptured because all you have is this like mad typing like really quick and then these amazing melodies that are formed you know and we even sort of agogically slow down to make it sound like the voice so it's full of illusion it's an illusion of a different sort but I thought that is interesting and so I got really into the piano as a typewriter opera as a kind of music inscription uh, device for typing sound um, and that it shared with uh, some of these uh, African instruments and and so what I did was simply run that that classic theme backwards and wow it was you know beautiful a little weird but beautifully weird and actually um, you know and carried with it all this potential and then wrote some variations on my own uh, over it and then took some of the other variations and sort of like I saw what they could do if and what and um, there are moments where one of the variations sort of suddenly veers off into a Schumann like world. Um, and it strangely sort of works and there's this kind of way in which it, it, it kind of was out of the material itself I, I wrote that one on a train between Boston and here I had a gig up at Harvard for a semester and I just had to keep taking this train and that's where it happened but the conception at the time was about this real interest in technologies and the grammars of action that they afford um, and then it just became you know this other thing and the two pianists uh, came in to play. The first version was the long one with the two pianists. And I thought there are so many more variations. 
uh, let's do another one and let's sort of bookend the album uh, with, with this particular uh, piece, which takes us, as I say, from the origins of the pianoforte um, uh, deep in the 18th century, all the way into the 21st century. So by the end, the final variation, which you can hear the Brahms one happening, but it's sort of, there's so much more um, sort of, a harmonic overlay that it sounds a little bit like I don't know like Coltrane or Van Halen or something you know has arrived on this music and it's almost like a little bit of a like cheap shot but it's very satisfying to play you know and so um that that was that was the um the story behind that piece uh, the story again is probably a lot bigger than what comes out in the music but that's you know that's I think that's the way of creation right we we see huge things out in the stars and then we try to render it and we can, you know our stars were really just caught in a little tin cup you know but that's okay that's totally okay and i'm i'm uh, you know i'm pretty proud of uh, proud of that uh, that that bookend of the vessel vessel you couple great well let's let's take a listen to uh, an excerpt from uh, that track uh, bobby mitchell of course on on piano again <laughs> as always to chat with you martin uh very illuminating about your process and all the, all the things you're thinking about with this music and uh just to remind everybody this uh scherzinger etudes album with bobby mitchell on piano is coming out on july 23rd and uh the catalog number is fcr 295 it'll be available in all the places you would expect it to be available and uh, we encourage you to check it out and also want to uh give uh due mention to ryan streber at octavan audio for uh, his great engineering work as always and wills glass spiegel uh who did the wonderful design and as i understand also does quite a lot of work with footwork in chicago is that right martin yeah yeah he's a he's doing a lot of um uh, work uh, both filming and sort of documenting this amazing tradition of footwork dancing in Chicago. Uh, Wills is amazing, as is Ryan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great, uh, great collaborative effort on this album. So maybe we're going to play this chat out with uh, the third to last track on the record, Nibiras de Saint Gervais. You want to sort of introduce that and then we'll, uh, we'll play some more music and, and be done. Yeah, very briefly. So um, Saint Gervais is a, a church in which Coubertin worked, um, and uh, the music uh, does uh, a sort of a stylistic riff on on Coubertin, and then gradually gets sort of enraptured by the high speed um, sort of polyrhythmic uh, world of of Imbiras. Um, I thought uh, the resonance was interesting because uh, both are uh, you know high high forms of art in the 17th century, both uh, in Saint Gervais and then also. Um, in in uh, the Great Zimbabwe, which is a, uh, an urban center that dates back to the 14th century, where the Mbira Zavazimu was, uh, you know, uh, it had its heyday actually. And so, bringing those two into a conversation is what that piece is all about. Very cool. Well, thanks again, Martin. Great to talk. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we're going to play play you out with Nibiras de Saint Gervais. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.